Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we'll be giving our weekly modeling and data report and talk vaccines. As you know, Vermont continues to lead the nation in vaccinations, approaching 84% of our eligible population receiving one dose, and about 75% who are fully vaccinated. As we said when we reached the 80% milestone and ended the state of emergency, we're not letting up. And what we're seeing across the country shows exactly why we can't. For the past several weeks, parts of the country with low vaccination rates have seen a dramatic increase in cases and hospitalizations. As you probably heard, this is being driven by the more transmissible Delta variant. Fortunately, and this is important, the vaccines are proving effective against all variants we've encountered so far including Delta. As the director of the CDC put it, this is becoming a pandemic of the unvaccinated. And on a much smaller scale, that is bearing out here in Vermont as well. The data clearly shows the risk of becoming a case is significantly higher for unvaccinated adults versus vaccinated. And when you look at hospitalizations and deaths, the data is even more stark. Even though cases here in Vermont are slightly increasing, and I, I want to repeat, slightly, we're still seeing very low hospitalization numbers and only one death in July. That's because we've done such a good job vaccinating our most vulnerable. Those with underlying health conditions and those above 60, which is now about six, or 90%. While a lot of attention is paid to so-called breakthrough cases, the real message here is if you want to avoid getting or spreading COVID-19, and if you want to make sure you recover if you do contract it, we hope you'll get your vaccine today. Or at the very least, talk to a trusted healthcare provider about it. The best tool we have to defeat the Delta variant is vaccination. Think about it for a second. About 16 months ago, many, many of us didn't believe that we'd have vaccines by now. Some speculated that it would take years and years before we had one that was effective. But with the incredible efforts of scientists, the administration, and the private sector, we have multiple highly effective and safe vaccines that can put this pandemic to an end. There are still about 90,000 Vermonters who are eligible who haven't gotten their shots. When you look at the age breakdown, although there we're making gains, younger people still lag behind their parents and grandparents. For those over 30, well over 80% have received at least one dose. For Vermonters between 22 and 29, we're at 62%. For 18 to 21, we're at 50%. For 16 and 17 year olds, as you remember, we gave them a week or two's head up, heads up and, uh, and a little bit of a head start uh, because we wanted them to experience a uh, more normal graduation. We lead the country was 71 percent and for 12 to 15 we're also a national leader at 63 percent but with school just five weeks away now is the time for children who haven't been vaccinated to do so in order to be fully protected by the start of the school year so whether you haven't gotten around to it yet or you're a parent of a child getting ready for the start of classes it's never too late to protect yourself and your loved ones. In a few minutes, Secretary Smith will go over all the places you can get your vaccine this week. But first, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for the data presentation. Commissioner Pichek. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Governor, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, reviewing uh, recent COVID-19 data, we uh, see again how interconnected our country is. 
About five weeks ago, COVID-19 cases started to rise in the United States. About four weeks ago, cases started to rise here in the Northeast. And then about three weeks ago, they started to rise here in Vermont, reminding us again that Vermont is not an island. But as the governor said, unlike many other parts of the country, Vermont's high vaccination rates have helped keep cases lower and have kept severe outcomes to a minimum. This week, we are reporting 171 new COVID-19 cases, again, with most of those cases being among those not fully vaccinated. And regarding breakthrough cases, this week we are sharing a new analysis. On the screen, you can see Vermont's overall case rate. This takes our 14-day average and compares it to the Vermont population. On the next slide, you will again see Vermont's overall case rate, but you will also see the case rates for the fully vaccinated population represented by the blue line at the bottom, and those who are not fully vaccinated represented by the orange line on the top. A really big takeaway is how stable our case rates have been over the last four months among the fully vaccinated population. To illustrate this point, let's compare April 1st to this week. On April 1st, Vermont was seeing 2.6 breakthrough cases a day on average, and yesterday that average was 5.3. However, back on April 1st, we only had 127,000 fully vaccinated Vermonters, and now that number stands at 420,000. So although the total number of breakthrough cases is higher today, we are actually seeing fewer breakthrough cases today relative to Vermont's fully vaccinated population. And comparing the highest vaccinated states to the least vaccinated states, we again see real life evidence of the effectiveness of the vaccines. We can see that cases are much lower in the higher vaccinated states. And most importantly, we see that vaccinations and particularly deaths are considerably lower. And when we add Vermont to this analysis, we see how much lower the nation's highest vaccinated state is. Vermont currently has the lowest hospitalization rate in the country and was the only state to not report a fatality this week. And looking at the most uh, recent forecast, we do expect cases uh, to remain elevated compared to where they were in June. And we expect that to continue for the next number of weeks again, driven by the more transmissible Delta variant, spreading among those who remain unvaccinated in Vermont. And it's important to keep in mind, if someone decides not to be vaccinated, they are choosing not only to endanger themselves, but those who they live with, work with, and socialize with, and ultimately are helping prolong the pandemic. But here in Vermont, we do continue to see progress. Uh, we had an additional 2,153 Vermonters starting vaccination this week, increasing the percentage of eligible Vermonters who have received at least one dose to a nation leading 83.6%. And again, Vermont continues to be the leader across the board when it comes to vaccination progress. We're also seeing some signs of hope across the country when it comes to vaccinations. Uh, the U.S. average in terms of those starting vaccination crept up this week, uh, driven largely uh, by increases in states that are seeing the highest COVID case counts, and particularly Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Florida. And you can see on the chart that those who have initiated vaccination did creep up this week in those states. Again, some uh, good news on the horizon. And finally, some other good news on the horizon. About six weeks ago, we talked about uh, the increase in cases in the UK uh, driven by the Delta variant, uh, and then how that Delta variant eventually took uh, seed here in the United States and spread. Uh, but over the last six days, cases in the United Kingdom have continued to track down. Now it's too early to tell whether that is a, a trend, uh, whether that's an anomaly in the data, but it's certainly uh, the first positive sign that we've seen from the UK, uh, giving some indication uh, that over the next three, four, five weeks, cases in the United States potentially will come down as well, uh, since we are about four or five weeks behind uh, the United Kingdom in terms of their case growth. So again, some potentially favorable news, and we'll keep a close eye on that over the next few weeks. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Secretary Smith.
Thank you, Commissioner Pichek. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as or good afternoon, everyone. I'm so used to the 11 o'clock start. As mentioned earlier, uh, we continue to maintain our number one position in the country in almost every vaccine category. As of this morning, we are approaching 84%, as you saw on the screen, 83.6 to be precise, of eligible Vermonters 12 years old and above have received at least one dose of the vaccine and 74.7% of all eligible Vermonters are fully vaccinated. I wanna thank Vermonters for stepping up to get vaccinated. If you haven't done so already, please get your shot. As Commissioner Pichek has illustrated, COVID cases are rising, especially in specific regions of the country. First, I wanna remind Vermonters of the various opportunities to get tested for COVID-19. And if you're traveling, especially to one of the spots that are seeing a spike in cases, you may wish to take the extra precaution and get tested upon your return to the state. This is especially important if you are unvaccinated. We, are, we still have a robust testing infrastructure offering testing at more than 23 locations throughout the state. And I urge Vermonters to take advantage of them. You can find the testing locations at the Health Department website at healthvermont.gov. Very soon, we will be transitioning to COVID resource centers that will offer both testing and vaccines. So we will continue to have plenty of testing opportunities. Now let's move on to the many available opportunities to get vaccinated. You can still walk into pharmacies, call your local pharmacist, or visit a CVS, Hannaford Food and Drugs, Walmart, Walgreens, Price Choppers slash Market 32, Rite Aid, Shaw Supermarket, or Costco. The following, the following clinics are on the same schedule as the previous weeks. University of Vermont Medical Center pharmacy locations at the UVM MC main campus, Fannie Allen and South Prospect Street, as well as weekdays at the community health centers of Burlington and Northwestern Medical Center urgent care clinic and daily at the Southwestern Vermont Medical Center express care. Here, here's where you'll find 27 other pop-up clinics this week. Today, Johnson State uh, Skate Park in Johnson, the Chester American Legion, the Jericho Market in Jericho. Uh, tomorrow, on July 28th, White River Junction District Office, that's the AHS District Office, uh, Bliss Village Store in Delhi in Bradford, Vermont, Gifford Healthcare in Randolph, Waterbury Ambulance in Waterbury Center, and the uh, Barry, um, 1311 Barry Montpelier Road that's behind the Burger King in Berlin. On Thursday, July 29th, Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital in St. Johnsbury, Wilmington Flea Market on Route 9, White River Junction District Office, again, Johnson's Sterling Market on Lower Main Street in Johnson and Waterbury's Farmer Market in the middle of Waterbury. On Friday, Coburn's General Store in South Stratford. The Community Cupboard uh, uh, in uh, Rutland, the Glover, uh, Glover uh, Ambulance Bay in uh, Glover, the a Scutney Outdoor Club in West Windsor, the Hardwick Farmers Market, that's on 140 Granite Street, the Vermont Distiller Distillers at Hogback Overlook in Marlboro, Buxton Store in Orwell, again 1311 Barry Montpelier Road behind the Burger King in Berlin, and the Walden Fire Station on Route uh, 12. The Saturday, July 31st. The Bellows Falls Old Homes Day in Bellows Falls, the fire department is putting that on. The Escutney Outdoor Club again in West Windsor. The Grand Isle Sheriff's Department, and that's right up on uh, Isle Circle in Grand Isle. Stowe Community Church in uh, Stowe at 137 Main Street. And on Sunday, August 1st, Thunder Road Speedway. 
Again, please take advantage of the many opportunities available to be vaccinated and to get tested for COVID-19. It has never been easier or more important. Thank you, all Vermonters, for doing your part to protect yourself, your loved ones, and your communities. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. <clears throat> Thank you. As a country, we're in an unfortunate stage of the pandemic. After many months of decreasing coronavirus infections, hospitalizations, and deaths, we're seeing that trend reverse in other parts of the U.S. where vaccination rates are low. This sadly has left millions of people still vulnerable to the virus. In Vermont, however, the picture is still hopeful. We continue to see slightly higher numbers of cases, but importantly, our hospitalization and deaths remain very low, a sign that our high levels of vaccination are keeping Vermonters safe. But this evolving pandemic means a continuing focus on emerging questions new studies, whether booster shots are coming, the effects of variants. It can seem like things are as complicated as they ever were. But we continue to follow the science we have and monitor new information as quickly as it comes out. So I'd like to emphasize what we do know. The best way to protect yourself right now is to get vaccinated. If you're vaccinated, you're highly protected against severe illness, hospitalization, and death, including from the Delta variant. Anyone who's not vaccinated is still vulnerable to experiencing the worst of COVID-19 and continues the potential to expose others to the virus, prolonging the pandemic for all. The main reason why we still struggle with the virus, even here in Vermont, is the cycle of increased transmission of virus among the unvaccinated population, which continues to lead to more opportunities for mutations and the production of more variant strains. That's evolution in real time occurring right before our eyes. I know there are people who may still have questions about the vaccine, who may have wanted to take more time before making the decision. So I want to emphasize again that we are here to help, along with your doctor, family, and friends. We want to make vaccination as easy as possible and for you to feel confident in your decision to protect yourself. But with more transmissible variants and cases rising, now's the time. People who are not vaccinated are the perfect hosts for the virus to set up shop, multiply, and mutate. I urge you to get your shots sooner rather than later and not become part of the pandemic of the unvaccinated. I've discussed here, and it has been reported in the news, some people do become infected with COVID-19 even if they've been vaccinated, the so-called breakthrough cases. However, as I hope you observed on Commissioner Pichek's slides, there is not an epidemic of cases among people in Vermont who have been vaccinated. In addition, and this is very important for everyone to know, the data continues to show that people who have been vaccinated are far, far less likely to experience serious illness, hospitalization, or death if they do become infected. As we see nationally, the majority of severe outcomes are almost exclusively in the unvaccinated. Because obviously, after vaccination, your body has new defenses to fight that infection. And that's why you are so much more protected. If you've already had COVID, we still want you to get vaccinated. That's because we don't yet know how long you're protected from getting sick again after you've recovered from COVID. Studies have shown pretty conclusively that vaccination provides a strong boost in protection in people who have already recovered from an episode of COVID. You can get vaccinated as soon as you've completed the 10-day isolation period. If you received monoclonal antibodies, the CDC recommends waiting 90 days. A CDC advisory committee met last week and discussed guidance for people 
who have conditions that might impact their immune system. They are not currently recommending either an additional dose of vaccine or a booster dose for this population. But if the FDA provides an emergency use authorization for that, they will evaluate the data once again. I also want to remind people about testing. With positivity rates in the U.S. and around the world, literally all over the map, if you travel to places with a lot of virus circulating or spend time with people who do, you can consider getting tested. Being tested is the only way for you to know if you've been infected with the COVID-19 virus, and testing, as well as common sense prevention efforts, are recommended regardless of vaccination status. Testing locations throughout Vermont, as you've heard, can be found at healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19. So finally, to sum up, our fastest way out of the pandemic and to protecting everyone's health is to achieve the highest vaccination rate possible. If you are vaccinated, you took the single most important step to protecting yourself, the people around you, and your community. And I again thank you. And if you can be vaccinated, but you aren't yet, go to healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19, where we've made it as easy as possible for you to quickly find a place, including the places that were listed by the Secretary a moment ago, a place near you to get your shot. And I hope you'll do that today. Governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Starting with folks in the room. Governor, a number of states, well, I guess California, New York City, and, I, and the, now the VA are requiring vaccinations. Have you given any thought to that in Vermont for state employees? Yeah, not in Vermont. Um, when you have a vaccination rate of about 84% and climbing, um, we're in a much better position than other states. So I don't think that's necessary at this point in time. Um, some outlets are reporting that the CDC later today is going to announce um, in, in places with high infection rates, masking indoors regardless of vaccination status. What do you make of that, that impending news? And do you think Vermont would have to, at some point, have to do something similar? Maybe? Yeah, I think the CDC is looking at their map and noticing the fact that there are many states that have uh, very high incidence rates of new cases. Uh, some of them are having significantly high hospitalization rates as well. Um, and they're trying to look at the data they have, which I have not seen yet, but they've reported that there are some new pieces of data that they have just begun to look at, um, new even from last week, that apparently are convincing them that uh, there are places where the transmission rates are so high that they feel that returning to mitigation processes like masking would be helpful. So um, I can't really give you an opinion on that. I haven't really seen the data. All I can say is uh, the fact that they're doing it in a way that recognizes there are places that have higher transmission versus lower transmission does make some public health sense, if you will. Uh, so I think that that's um, something reasonable in some of those states. I don't think, to answer the last part of your question, that um, Vermont would see much of an impact by what's going to come out because we're going to be considered one of the very low transmission states at this point in time. And it would, again, just be the travel guidance I kind of provided in my opening comments. Um, people would naturally want to be more careful if they're traveling to a place that has higher levels of community transmission. Uh, they might also want to be tested when they return, uh, if the, even if they're feeling well, just because they've been to a place of higher level of transmission. What are your thoughts this week about masks indoors in schools? Masks indoors in schools? Well, certainly we're going to come up with a decision on that uh, probably at this press conference next week. We're currently meeting on that right now as, as we speak. Dr. Levine, if, if the vaccination rate doesn't get appreciably better in some of the states where it's not that high, do you expect um, to see some of the restrictions return that the state had, including restrictions on people entering the state? I don't think that we've really 
have a situation like that at this point in time. I think we're again looking at our data like we always look at, and we're basically seeing, as you saw on the uh, graphics, uh, where things are, and they've been kind of state of stable. We had reported 11 cases yesterday. Uh, we have uh, five to six people in the hospital at this time. Knock on wood, we've had no deaths really in the month of July except one. Um, so uh, there's not a reason to, for us to take an alarmist kind of stance uh, and make any major changes. Yeah, I think we just have to uh, reflect on how far we've come in a year. Um, think back about a year ago, last summer. Um, there were no fairs uh, at that point in time. Uh, there's no gatherings of any substance. Uh, restaurants were restricted uh, and people were staying home in a lot of respects. That's all changed. Everything's open. I mean, the Lamoille County Fair uh, opened up this past weekend. I had a lot of people attending. I, was, I went to an, a number of parades this year. A lot of people there as well. No masks and, and people just enjoying being outside. And we had 11 cases yesterday, as Dr. Levine had said. We have five or six in the hospital as of today. So from the beginning, uh, we wanted to make sure that our healthcare system was protected, that we didn't overwhelm the healthcare uh, system. And we've done that. And it's, it's very low and very low risk. So we've done a great job here in Vermont. And we should uh, take advantage of that in a lot of respects. And I, you know, the traffic count uh, that I saw uh, from last week, we're, uh, we're getting close uh, to 2019 levels at this point. Uh, so again, we're almost back to normal. How many fully vaccinated Vermonters have been hospitalized due to COVID-19? And have we had any fully vac vaccinated Vermonters die due to COVID-19? So over the course of the pandemic, we've had, I believe, uh, five people hospitalized and one death in that category. But you're asking the question that I'm asking real time now uh, to get some of the very recent data uh, about the people who are in the hospital most recently, knowing that on any given day, we literally have either two or three or five or six people. So statistically speaking, it's gonna be very hard to make a lot of conclusions from that. Um, it sounds like there's gonna be no uh, change in guidance from on high from the administration. Should Vermonters be considering behavioral modifications in light of uh, this slight but perceptible increase in cases here? When you say from on high, you're talking about the national? No, I'm talking about, it, it sounds like the governor in, in consultation with you has no plans to reinstitute the mask mandate, for instance, or reinstitute travel restrictions. Um, but are there things that Vermonters should be doing of their own volition in light of the fact that cases yeah. are up now and, and forecast to start going up, it looked like, to more than 50 a day you're anticipating by August. Sure. Much of it is the same kind of advice we've been giving all through the pandemic. We have a web page on our uh, COVID website that is labeled uh, how to protect yourself, and it gives some suggestions. Uh, because you're right, we've not set any policies regarding any of this. Most people who are uh, feeling that their immune system is not um, up to speed, whether they've had a history of cancer or under current treatment for cancer or have some immune suppressing drugs that they take, we obviously tell them uh, both locally and nationally that they should always be exercising more care because of the scientific data that indicates that they may not have the same response to a vaccine that a person with a more intact immune system has. Um, and then we have people who uh, are either unable to or have chosen not to be vaccinated. And there's advice on that page uh, regarding uh, the usual kinds of strategies they can take in terms of their uh, personal hygiene, avoiding crowded situations, et cetera. Governor, your colleague, uh, Governor Sununu, just signed a medical freedom from immunization bill the other day, uh, declaring that it's your right uh, not to get a vaccine. Um, would you sign such a bill here? Do we need such a bill there? If not, why not? Um, I, I don't believe we need a bill of that uh, um, for, for Vermont. Um, 
we have 84 uh, percent being vaccinated at this point in time and, and again it's still climbing so when you think about that um, we're in a much better position than, than New Hampshire even uh, although they're not uh, uh, they're not in the lower category they're in the upper category uh, amongst the Northeast states um, so it may be a, a statement um, but um, but I don't think we need that incentive uh, it I don't think it would work and uh, I mean I, I don't I just don't think that that we need to um, to have that we've already allowed people to make their own decisions we're just trying to educate and uh, do the best we can to um, make it as easy as possible for uh, them to get vaccinated and they've taken advantage of that so again I think we have a little ways to go but we keep chipping away at it every single week so this is in the point so to speak. Not from this Republican no uh, have you learned anything more about your uh, request for a northern governor's meeting with Canada yes um, cool. we're, we're still waiting uh, we brought it through the channels so to speak with the National Governors Association because we wanted to give other governors the opportunity to sign on and uh, make sure that they could uh, attend the meeting so it's it's slowed a bit um, but uh, we're, uh, we're still waiting for other governors to sign on to a letter um, requesting the meeting at this point. So we hope they will react to that quickly and uh, because there is a lot of interest from other governors as well as we found out once we started talking about it. Proponents of a statewide paid family and medical leave program are gonna be sort of relaunching their campaign to get some momentum behind that later this week. Um, you had talked about the pandemic sort of thwarting your initial attempts to create the program, the voluntary program that you had called for. Uh, where does that stand and are you yeah. beginning to revisit? We your... are. Um, we are looking at that uh, as we speak. Um, we're trying to, uh, we want to put the RFP back out and uh, see if we can move forward with that on the voluntary basis. Now I know on a national scale, uh, the, the other package uh, that uh, the president and others, uh, Senator Sanders, have been talking about uh, the three trillion dollar, I think it's three point five trillion dollar package, has paid family leave in that as well. So we'll see where that goes. Um, but uh, but here in Vermont, we want to continue to move forward on the voluntary plan. Uh, is your RPO? Yeah, it has not yet, but uh, but we're putting it together. Governor, it looks like um, last week. I don't know, last, um, last month, um, the general fund was, was up quite a bit, um, to, to the tune of $33 billion or so. What, what do you make of, of where we are in this economic moment? Yeah. Well, it's good news, right? Uh, as opposed to um, what we thought was going to happen when the pandemic first uh, reared its ugly head. And so with all the, the money that has been coming through the doors uh, from the federal government uh, it's created a lot of economic activity and we benefited from that substantially here in Vermont uh, obviously uh, the year's end a little over 200 million in surplus so again good news um, we'll have an emergency board meeting on Friday where we'll take a look and see where we were at and where we want to go uh, in the future um, whether we're going to upgrade um, that uh, uh, that uh, projection um, but I just want to just put a tone of caution out there um, I'm not sure how the solid this foundation is uh, because a lot of it is based on uh, an influx of federal money so I just want to be at least keep our eyes wide open uh, not get too accustomed to this because uh, once the federal money starts flowing in and it may not be right now obviously we still have a lot of the ARPA money coming in I just uh, just want to be careful that's all but it's good news for Vermont question for Dr. Levine we had some smoky skies out there yesterday and some poor air quality um, have you given any thought to how people dealing with long COVID uh, might react to being outside all day in an area with poor air quality. I know it's not as cut and dry as some of the other lung and heart issues, but did you give that any thought on, you know, what that person might be going through? Yeah, I didn't give it thought for that population specifically, more the population of people who have some chronic respiratory disease, so a bigger umbrella that would cover that population. Um, 
I wish I could tell you we knew enough about long COVID that it would be easy to answer the question because it's really something that's under real-time study right now. Um, there are people whose manifestation of long COVID is shortness of breath. There are people whose manifestation of long COVID is poor exercise tolerance. Uh, but there are many others who are only talking about fatigue or a, a brain fog syndrome. Um, not that that's only, because those are terrible as, as much. But by the same token, we don't have good data that shows us the lungs of people with long COVID are actually damaged in some irreversible way uh, with scarring and things of that sort. So I'd rather look at it just as a picture of people who might have a respiratory condition, in which case those last couple of days, uh, the appearance of the sky was hazy. When you look on the uh, weather service site, we were in that zone between yellow and red. Yellow being not as good as green, obviously, but uh, you could do okay outside. Getting towards the red uh, is more like being out in the west where the fires were actually occurring. Uh, so I was concerned at that point in time. I don't know if this is a question you could know the answer to, but um, the seven day new case count for July of the July 27th of this year is higher than it was for the seven day, the same period last year. Um, and yet we have a 83 vac 83 percent vaccination rate now. We had a zero percent vaccination rate then. Is the reason for that more to do with the fact that everybody is, uh, you know, communing again in spaces, uh, or is it the Delta variant, variant that's driving? Yeah, I would think it's a little more by the Delta variant. It's just a more transmissible virus. You know, it's being talked about as 60% more transmissible than the one that came before it, which was the B117, uh, which was more transmissible by 50% over the original one that we started with. So I think it's the transmission rates more than anything else. Um, people are outside. Uh, there's nothing that would make me reverse the fact that scientifically we know way reduced chances of transmitting virus in an outdoor environment. Um, and even though people have been in indoor environments, we're just not seeing that kind of spike in cases that uh, would get us that concerned. And maybe Secretary Smith on this one. What are you What are you seeing for for data in terms of uptake of the vaccine among primary care providers? I know that was one of the big strategies that the state had turned to. Yeah. So um, you know, the number of primary care providers that are now fully enrolled and trained is very high in the states. Not everybody, but it's certainly much higher. And uh, I know that they're deploying vaccine. But I think what we're seeing is that. Uh, the population that would probably benefit the most from that site would be those who really wanted the comfort and safety of getting the vaccine in that setting and talking to the people they trusted the most in that setting. And based on the incremental increases in uh, that percentage, now up to 83.6, but obviously before primary care was involved, it was at least a percentage lower. We're seeing increases. Uh, I just don't want you to think that they're dramatic increases. Uh, they're making a difference. It's part of a multi-pronged strategy. That's why all the sites that were described are still going to be uh, coming online, because we, we'll get other Vermonters uh, to stumble over the vaccine in those settings or to even plan to get the vaccine in those settings. But in the primary care setting, it's going to be incremental, but not huge jumps but still an important part of the system. And uh, that will continue on. Secretary, did you have anything to add? Governor, uh, are we getting any closer to enforcement action against Slate Ridge in Pollock? We're still monitoring the situation. Obviously, uh, they've taken uh, a, a different approach, an approach that they uh, have tried to take from the beginning and working through the court system in terms of uh, zoning violations and so forth and, and uh, um, other, uh, other sanctions uh, against the owner. So is it now just sort of in a... We're, we're still monitoring, obviously. I want to keep everyone safe, but uh, it seems to have subsided a bit. 
uh, at this point in time, but we're still paying attention. All right, I'll move to the phones now, starting with Eric Nichols Frazier, the Valley Reporter. Do you anticipate uh, do you anticipate uh, insurance companies charging higher premiums for folks who are unvaccinated like they do for other high risk behaviors? I'm going to ask the expert to answer this one, <laughs> Mr. Pichet. Uh, thank you, Governor. So we don't, you know, this question was asked a few months ago, and um, you know, we don't anticipate that uh, being the case. I mean. You know, obviously the, the um, case rates are up a bit, but hospitalization rates are, are still steady and they've been low. And with our high vaccination rate, it probably uh, won't mean much in terms of an impact at this point. But we do have regulations um, that are in place and we're planning to extend them that requires commercial health insurers to cover the cost of uh, treatment, uh, preventative uh, or inpatient or outpatient treatment. Um, and the health insurers do have that um, budgeted in their, uh, in their projections for 20 uh, 21 and 2022. So we don't anticipate that in Vermont. Okay, great. And is the Agency of Education asking school districts to prepare for both in-person and hybrid learning in the fall? Is Secretary French on the line? Yes, good afternoon, Governor. Uh, at this point, uh, we're directing schools to prepare for full in-person instruction. Uh, we haven't given out any direction on uh, doing both remote and in-person. Thank you. Michael Doherty, Vermont Digger. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask why in the uh, vaccination dashboard, uh, as well as the numbers that we uh, tend to be seeing at these press conferences, the uh, focus remains the, the sort of top line vaccination rate among the eligible population. Uh, when it seems as though, given the risk that we talked about with the Delta variant, that uh, knowing the uh, percentage of the, the total population uh, that's out in public uh, that, that hasn't been fully vaccinated seems to be more of the key number when we're thinking about the, the transmissibility here. Uh, but what's the reason for, for uh, kind of maintaining the, the top line numbers the, the way that they're being presented? Um, I'll ask uh, Commissioner Pichek to answer that, but maybe I'd ask a question back. Are you seeing uh, a different metric being used across the country? We're just trying to be consistent with everyone else. Certainly, I, I think that what we've seen is that, uh, you know, different numbers are reported in different situations, but uh, certainly as it, as it pertains to the Delta variant, it seems that there's been more attention paid to the, the total number of people who might be in a given place that are not fully vaccinated, given that that uh, somewhat represents more of the risk. And I would also say specifically here in Vermont, given that the uh, vaccination rate isn't consistent from county to county that there there might be places here where the top line number uh, might be masking groups or geographic areas where potentially more than half of the people might be uh, not actually fully vaccinated and, and therefore more susceptible. Mr. Pichet. Yeah, th thank you for the question. I mean, um, you know, I think when you look at the percent of eligibility, it's really getting at the question of, um, you know, what's the willingness of your population to get vaccinated? So that uh, continues to be a high interest to us here in Vermont and across the country. And obviously the data shows that we have a very uh, high willingness in Vermont for people to get vaccinated. Uh, in terms of showing, you know, the, the full population, we certainly do that every week. Our vaccine scorecard includes that, you know, 73.9% this week. 65.9% uh, fully vaccinated. So, you know, we've we've used those numbers quite frequently. Those are the numbers that are often used for, you know, trying to determine herd immunity uh, and those kind of thresholds. But uh, but again, we, we do report that um, every week. And uh, it is certainly also an important number, not to say it's not an important number, but uh, obviously if children cannot get the vaccine, if a large percentage of your population can't get the vaccine, and you're trying to determine uh, willingness to get it, then uh, obviously focusing on the eligible population makes more sense. Thank you. I, I had one other question that was uh, wondering whether there's been any change in the amount of uh, sequencing that we've been doing to detect the presence of specific variants, uh, just given how quickly the Delta variant has become dominant and hearing now that there may be other variants on the way, um, has there been any change to the amount of, of sequencing that we've been doing of test samples on that? I'll let Dr. Levine answer that. Um, but going back to the previous question, I was just thinking that 
if, um, if all states were to give their eligible population, we'd still be the leader in the country because of our demographics. Uh, as you probably are aware, Mike, you know, we're the third oldest state in the country, uh, and it's very close between us, New Hampshire, and Maine. Um, so uh, that would even push us up the ladder a little bit further, I think, if everyone reported on, um, on the overall population. So I think we're still in great shape. Dr. Levine. And, I, and I'd echo that. And, and some numbers are more helpful because they help you define your strategies about getting to the part of the population that's um, still not taking the vaccine but could have if they wanted to. Uh, so it's really important to us to be able to know um, where, where, what percentage of the population is in that group. With regard to whole genome sequencing, the um, way that gets done in the state of Vermont is three separate ways. Uh, one is through the CDC's 50-state uh, approach, which uh, does a random sampling state-to-state. Uh, -state. The second is through our partnership with the Broad Laboratory in Boston, who does a lot of the testing at our state COVID resource centers. And then the third way is through our own public health lab with the samples that might come their way. Now, the public health lab does a select amount of sampling in the state, often based on outbreak situations, often based on vulnerable populations. So um, those three separate pools. So the CDC pool is a very small number, and it's um, less predictable in terms of when you'll know it, but it's about every week we'll get some information from that. The Broad um, is a batch operation, so it can literally go several weeks between times that they run their batch. And the public health lab is usually much quicker, although this is not a same-day test, so it takes a number of days to probably a week to get a result. Um, and it can only go on the smaller number of samples we're now doing at that lab. So the strategy is still to sample as much as possible. And with the number of cases we have in Vermont, we can sample a higher percentage of them. I just can't give you results as quickly as I'd like to from any of those because of the fact that uh, they're less predictable and don't come back with the same frequency. But we are seeing some more deltas in Vermont for sure. Um, CDC looks at about 15 states, and in the 15 states they've looked at, which don't include Vermont, but are scattered across the country, five of those states have rates of Delta greater than 50 percent. The remaining have rates somewhere uh, higher than 10 and lower than 50 percent, but it's usually still the leading variant in the states that they report from. B117 has gone down uh, pretty significantly, but it's still the second leading strain found. And then things like South African and Brazil are now being found at much, much lower levels nationwide. All right. Thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. I have an economic development question for you. Um, when we, hear, we talk to employers and development officials, they talk about the usual impediments to economic development, like broadband and housing and workforce. But another thing that keeps coming up consistently now and more now is childcare. You've talked uh, in the past about holding preschool in the public school system. Uh, unlike those infrastructure projects, that's something that, that could be done relatively quickly, certainly quicker than some of these other problems. Uh, is that something that they'd be willing to push uh, the legislature to move through, maybe even not only preschool, but even pre-preschool, uh, moving that into the public school system, into the public school buildings, something like that to take care of this or help take care of this problem? Well, for a number of years, as you know, um, we've focused on the cradle-to-career concept, and uh, that is certainly something that we'll continue uh, to work towards. Um, seeking uh, help from the legislature and making that happen um, because, as you said, uh, child care is, a, uh, is an issue for many, and uh, we want to, uh, to make sure that we provide um, that capacity um, because this is uh, an influential uh, time of, of the, 
child's life, uh, as well as an uh, impediment to many getting to work. So uh, there's a lot of areas. It's not just the physical infrastructure, uh, but uh, but it's workforce there as well. I mean, we we have challenges in every single sector, as you well know, Tim. And uh, child care providers uh, are an example of another sector uh, that is in uh, demand as well. So we'll we'll continue uh, to provide any means we can uh, to alleviate that situation and move again towards this uh, um, cradle to career concept that I've spoken so much about over the last four to five years. All set, Tim? I think you're, you muted yourself. Looking at the um, general fund uh, revenues that just came out, there's there seems to be plenty of money uh, available to do something um, with the child care issue and relative to Kobe. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Well, again, <clears throat> there will be uh, a number of uh, areas of, uh, that we want to invest the money. We'll have our ideas on how that would uh, uh, be best spent, and I'm sure the legislature has a few ideas of their own. So. Uh, I don't think you'll see anything out of the ordinary from our standpoint as we present our budget in January. Uh, same type of things, uh, the, the same type of things that we've been uh, promoting over the last four or five years. But um, again, cradle to career is something that uh, we've spoken a lot about, early care and learning uh, in particular. Uh, thank you, Governor. There were some technical problems. Thank you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes. If there's going to be any new mandates, any changes um, as to the, as to the head back to the classroom. Yeah, uh, Dr. Levine and, and Secretary French, uh, amongst others, are uh, talking about that as we speak. I would say in the next week, uh, hopefully, and if not, the week week after. Uh, we'll be able to provide more guidance. But, uh, but again, the good news is uh, they're going back to school in person full time. So that's the, that's the good news. We couldn't say that a year ago. Right. Okay, thank you, Governor. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Hello, Governor. Um, yesterday, we published the first person account about a state employee who underwent the mandatory equity and diversity training for state employees. He said the instructor refused to take any questions. Uh, the instructor saying that questions are self-serving, said that being colorblind is racist and that the nuclear family was something, quote, pushed on us, unquote, by the white power structure. Um, also said he's been threatened now twice with job termination for questioning aspects of this instruction and uh, says that a coming equity audit on state employees will feature a inclusion score that measures the employee level of belonging in the work environment. So hearing this, and I'm sure you, you've heard about this, you know, over the last few months off and on, uh, do you support the idea of an equity audit of state employees, and do you have any concerns about how this equity and diversity training is being carried out? Um, first of all, I, this is something new. I have not uh, heard about this, and um, it sounds like an HR issue that we'll have to, maybe there's been some formal complaint by this one individual uh, that they're, um, they're working on, but I, I have not heard about this. Uh, in terms of uh, equity training, uh, and um, I think it's important. It's something that uh, that I think we all have to be aware of and sensitive to, and uh, we'll continue uh, to to provide uh, that uh, that education for our employees. But if you sense that in the process of doing this, there's uh, perhaps some lines being crossed 
uh, is that something that, that your administration would take a look at and, and say, is this being done right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we can always improve. And we want to, first of all, you know, this isn't... Um, we want to educate people, much like we have with the pandemic. It's been uh, about not forcing people, but uh, educating uh, them uh, so that they make the right decisions. And uh, we've been successful with the pandemic. Uh, hopefully, we'll be successful with the uh, the racial equity training as well. But we can always improve, okay. obviously. The, uh, the part that this seems to me perhaps more forced than educational is the uh, the equity audit where, where this becomes essentially it sounds like part of an employee's performance review how well they score on their equity audit uh, is were you aware of any of this and uh, what's your kind of initial take on that yeah i i am not aware of the equity audit but uh, we'll take a look and see i just i'm just not aware of that okay thank you governor Viora Angle Smith, Vermont Digger. Hi, uh, this is a question for the health officials. Um, so we have about 90,000 folks who are not vaccinated yet, and we talked a little bit about the fact that they skew younger, but I wonder um, of these, this group, like how many folks are um, refusing to get vaccinated versus sort of having an access issue? And if so, sort of how does how do you guys plan on sort of reaching as many people as possible? Are there any initiatives for specific groups so that, uh, you know, we get to the, to the, to the herd immunity that we're all kind of trying to get? That's Levine. I think I got most of what you were asking about. It's really approaches to people who have still not gotten vaccinated but are eligible to get vaccinated. So. I've quoted before, and I'll do it again. Um, we have a couple of pieces of survey data, some from the Kaiser Family Foundation, some from uh, a New York Times uh, article that covered all the states and really looked to try to categorize people who have not gotten vaccinated in various groupings. The most resistant grouping were people who were very skeptical of vaccine, or very mistrustful of government. And needless to say, that varied from state to state. But in Vermont, that was our smallest group, well under 5% of people. Uh, very challenging group to deal with. Um, one can only hope that uh, efforts to be transparent like we are here and communicate broadly and engage with people would allow some of that skepticism to decrease and willingness to get vaccinated increase because uh, they would gain trust in public officials and in their government. The rest of the spectrum of people who hadn't gotten vaccinated were more in the group of uh, either people who just hadn't put it in their priority list, didn't feel that they could take time off from work, or were concerned about getting side effects the day after the vaccine and missing some work, uh, or um, it just wasn't on their radar screen. And efforts to help that group of people, which was a little larger in Vermont, but still relatively small, since we're only dealing with now 16% uh, of the eligible population, uh, that group uh, has really been our strategy of trying to meet the Vermonter where they are and bring the vaccine to them. Make it so easy to uh, stumble upon that um, if there's three friends that are walking uh, to a beach together or to a fair or some other major event and two of them have been vaccinated and the third hasn't, it's like, well, look, there's a tent right there. We're here now, why don't you just do it? It looks quick and easy. Uh, so that kind of strategy, which is very, very important. Uh, but the reality is um, we brought the vaccine to places where I don't think other states had even dreamed you could do that. And now we're finding that some of them are trying to mirror what we've done here. So the so-called barnstorming approach uh, with trusted people in the state, like uh, public officials in each of those towns, EMS, uh, has been very, very effective uh, in very rural parts of Vermont and will continue, obviously. The work sites, 
Um, some of them, um, we asked them if we could come to some of the larger employers, and we found conditions that would allow us to make that productive in terms of time of day or shift or what have you, um, and asked them to ask us if there were places that we hadn't been to uh, so that we could arrange to help their employees. And most employers were eager to make sure their employees were helped. So those kinds of strategies as well. The bottom line was um, there's a category that hasn't been well talked about publicly besides people who are totally skeptical or are just what they call vaccine hesitant. There are people who are now labeled vaccine apathy or apathetic, meaning it's just not on their radar at all, and they haven't really got a, anything in the game for it, like they're not so against it or anything, it's just not a priority. So we're really trying to reach that group of people with a lot more public education and making sure that they have complete access, walk-in appointments, no, no scheduled uh, appointments needed, et cetera. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Okay. All set, Lior? Thank you. Greg Lamro, the county courier. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, I think I wanted to just follow up on that last question. Uh, of the roughly 16% of the general public that is still accessible or, or is still. Uh, of, of age to be able to get the vaccine. I'm wondering, have there been any studies to, to try to figure out the percent of that population that, that has a legitimate medical concern and, and can't be vaccinated versus those who just don't want to be versus those who, you know, it, it just hasn't been convenient? Yeah, I'd say it's a, a mixture of all of the above, um, but uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Levine has any specifics on that, but. Okay, I'll let Dr. Levine. Greg, when you think about it, there, there are very few medical reasons that you can't get the COVID vaccine. Um, when there was only the messenger RNA vaccine available, uh, there are a select group of people with significant allergic reactions to some of the components, but that's a very, very small group. Um, and now we have a vaccine, J&J, &J, that uh, is a totally different platform, and that same concern doesn't uh, apply to that. So medically speaking, uh, let's even say it was 2%. It's going to be a very, very small percent of all eligible people and not have a, a super high impact. Um, but it is unfortunate for those people. Um, and we need to make sure we work with them and have strategies that would allow them to get vaccinated. Some of that group of people who were advised by the uh, physicians caring for them to not get vaccinated at a certain point in time because they were worried about interrupting treatment for conditions that required some heavy duty immune modulating medications. Um, but even in that group, there's a point in time that they would reach where that wouldn't have been as big a concern. So over the now seven months that we've been using vaccine, seven and a half months really, uh, I would think that most of that group is now found at a moment in time where they could get vaccinated as well. So pretty small is the uh, answer. Appreciate that, Dr. V. Um, Governor, if and when a booster becomes necessary to continue to battle this virus, do you expect that a booster would be uh, free for the general public? I would only be speculating, but I would assume so. Um, and we'll just have to wait uh, for the recommendations from the CDC and FDA on that and, uh, and then take, uh, take it from there. But, but I would assume uh, that it would be. Thank you. And uh, just lastly, Governor, I think you touched on it a little bit a few minutes ago. Uh, can you give us a brief update on, on your work with the uh, possibly trying to get the northern border reopened for vaccinated Canadians to travel to, to Vermont? And uh, I'm, I'm specifically wondering if your uh, recent appointment to the Council of Governors has helped uh, you be able to advocate for, for reopening the border. Yeah, um, have not on that 
on that platform. We haven't officially met at this point uh, on the Council of Governors, <clears throat> but through the National Governors Association, uh, again, we reached out, uh, I reached out to Governor uh, Hutchinson and uh, Governor Murphy and asked them if we could do something through the uh, NGA. And uh, they approved that, or sending the letters out, I believe, uh, out to other governors to sign on to um, so that we can uh, get some uh, others uh, involved and have this meeting with the with the federal government on this. Because, you know, from my standpoint, it just it doesn't make any sense uh, that uh, the uh, Canadian government <clears throat> has opened up uh, their border. And... Um, and so that allows Americans to go to Canada. And uh, when you compare uh, the risk of the entire country versus the risk, uh, you know, in terms of COVID uh, to the risk of the, the Canadian uh, Canadians, uh, they're, in, they're in better shape than we are as a country. Uh, certainly, uh, we have nothing to fear uh, from them in, in a lot of respects. So. It just doesn't make a lot of sense from my perspective, and we should open up the border and allow travel. And if they have to reciprocate in terms of uh, the conditions, they should just do so. Uh, I know that there's certain conditions uh, for Americans coming into uh, to Canada, <clears throat> and and then we allow them obviously to return uh, through through our border. So I just don't know what the problem is we're trying to solve here. So we'll learn more once we have the meeting. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for your time, and thank you to Dr. Levine. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Tom Davis. All right, we'll try Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thanks. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Uh, back to the question of school guidance. Uh, you mentioned there was ongoing discussion over mask recommendation and other guidance in the works. How specific do you expect that guidance to be in comparison to, to the guidance provided last school year? And is it possible that students across the state could have substantially different experiences this fall? depending on how aggressive some districts decide to get with safety measures? Um, well, that's uh, to be determined. Again, they're in ongoing discussions. Uh, we'll see what they come up with uh, next week or the week after. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll determine at, the, at that point uh, what, uh, what type of guidance uh, that we're going to give. Uh, obviously, our state is, uh, the school districts are locally controlled, uh, so it would be just that. It would be guidance, and uh, then they would have to make their own decisions. Anything you want to so add, Dr. Lee? Yeah, um, uh, so without the uh, state of emergency, none of the binding guidance and uh, requirements that were issued last year obviously won't uh, be in place. Um, you know, one of the one of the criticisms that we heard from school administrators was some of the ambiguity in that guidance. It, it, is it going to be even more murky this fall? And and so some schools may decide to pod their students, and others may keep their cafeterias closed. And, and you'll really have kind of a hot podge of response, um, depending on what local school boards might deem uh, inappropriate response. Yeah, you said a lot there, Andrew, but. Um... Uh, I guess hodgepodge wasn't uh, wasn't what I thought it was last year. I thought we were fairly clear, uh, Dr. Levine. The, just to parse that out a little, Secretary French and I plan that the guidance will be clear, and it won't be something that um, one school district could do one thing with, and another could do another thing with, based on their interpretation of it. It would only be based on the decision making, as the governor indicated, made at the local level. The, the guidance itself will will be will be clear for the state of Vermont. Okay, I look forward to it. Thank you very much. 
All right. Thanks very much for tuning in, and we'll see you again next Tuesday.